Welcome back, everybody. Today we'll be continuing our review of George R. R. Martin's past works before A Song of Ice and Fire. As usual, this is Amin, and I'm joined by some vassals of Kingsgrave who will introduce themselves. Hi, this is Amber, Amber Box on the forum. Hi, this is Greg. I'm Claudius the Fool on the forums. Hi, this is Lee. I'm Lord Manderbly on the forums. And uh, I'm Michael, Mordian on the forums. Good to be back. So, uh, looking forward to talking about this. There's a couple of things I wanted to go over, especially Lee wasn't here last time. We kind of came up with some definitions I wanted to hammer out. Uh, we came up with two terms, Martin Sphere and George Verse. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't really define it. The way I'm going to define it is Martin Sphere. I'm just going to count anything that he's written is Martin Sphere, including A Song of Ice and Fire. And George Verse is, is just the collection of short stories in his science fiction universe that are tied together. And for this particular review, we're doing a second kind of loneliness, which I'm not sure if it falls into the George Verse or not. If it is, it's certainly early in the George Verse. I don't think it's part of the Thousand Worlds. Yeah. Yeah, I think probably not either. Yeah, yeah there was nothing would, real specific to tie it in there. It doesn't have hyper travel, that kind of stuff. It yeah. It's kind of weird travel. And this could be very early in the Thousand Worlds if you wanted to tie it in. This could be like... <laughs> I think that it doesn't make sense with... um. What's the first, like, George verse story? The one with the uh, super soldiers? Hmm. Because, like, you get a teeny bit of info. That's, like, when the Empire still hasn't crumbled. And you get a teeny bit of info about, like, how they've started to travel. And Mm. this, I don't think, makes sense in that. I think it's just different sci-fi. Exactly. And it doesn't really need to be because it's just a short story that he wants to talk about some general feelings and truths. He doesn't really need to... If he doesn't need to develop the world that much, he does, kind of, even at the same time. (laughs) Yeah. And he can't help but develop it even in, like, a 12-page story. Uh, what we'll do is just, so this is going to be a spoiler full review of Second Kind of Loneliness. It's available, I believe, in Dream Songs is the easiest place to find it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's in volume. Where I have it, yeah. <clears throat> it's also a nice short read, so feel free to pause and go through it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, let's start and just go around and give a quick lemon cake uh, review. I'm going to give it, uh, and the way I do my own scale, anybody can do it the way they want. I just compare it to other short story works that he does. I give it 4.5 out of 5 lemon cakes. I really enjoyed the story. I read it a long time ago. Uh, I think he's hit some nice underlying truths in it at times. I was looking to buy Martin stuff, usually Ice and Fire stuff, but I was able to buy his uh, a copy of the comic with like the original print from oh, uh, December 1972 for really cheap. Oh, from Analog? Oh. It was an Analog, right? Yeah, Analog, yeah. Nice. So yeah. I have it, and it's signed by the uh, artist. So it's, it's, wow. It, it, that bumps it up as well, just having like, my hands on it, right? It's something I might want to get signed by George at some point. I think he'd be, he'd be tickled Absolutely. that you're asking him to sign that, not an Ice and Fire book, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> More brownie points. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you guys for reviews? Um, I would give it a 4.75. I really like this story. I I don't read a ton of sci-fi, but I just love the the imagery and the just how it just cuts so quick to kind of I don't know, it just it just it's such a gut punch. Um, so, yeah, I really liked it. Uh, I gave it I I gave it a four point four point seven five also I think I really the first couple entries I kind of thought it was just going to be another like Robinson Crusoe in space kind of story which there's been <laughs> a lot of but when it got to that one entry that like Amber said it was just a complete gut punch like he put into words you know stuff that is kind of hard to say and hard to articulate sometimes but when he was literally talking about the second kind of loneliness um, you know it was just uh, it was a real one of the most emotional just couple pages in, in a short story that I've ever read so uh, four point seven five I'd say. For me, I would say, uh, like, if I'm comparing it to his other early short stories, because I think this is one of his earliest, I'd give it a five. But compared to, like, his short story, story like, work more whole, I would give it probably, like, a 4.5, maybe 4.2. Because, like, this is one of my favorites, and I really love it. Um, it doesn't have quite the, compl- like, complexity some of his later ones do, but it, it has that, like, beautiful knack for sort of... Like melon, that melancholy tone that he has such a gift for. Mm-hmm. I'm sort of uh, it's it's not one of my favorites, and um, not because of any um, failing in the writing or anything like that. Um, I think that he does uh, communicate really well the second kind of loneliness, what he's trying to talk about, and it is certainly I think short stories are mostly or a lot of the times are mainly about communicating an idea rather than telling a, a story more. Mm. But for me, just the the story part of it was was not quite enough to pull me all the way into the idea, and so I don't know. I'm I'm hovering somewhere around maybe three point five or something like that. I liked it. Not one of my favorites though. 
yeah, I think it's a good way of putting it. I mean, uh, his stories often have the the story medium and the message. The message is hit really strong here, but the story is just used as a means here. Yeah, yeah. it kind of reminded me of uh, a lot of Arthur C. Clarke stories kind of like come down to the last sentence or the last paragraph, and then they kind of, that's where the twist is or where the punch is. And you mm-hmm. kind of got that in this one where it really was that last section that made it all fit together. And that was sort of the, the aha moment was, you know, the whole repetition and everything. But it uh, yeah. it did have echoes of that. But I, I don't know if that's what he was going for consciously, but that's sort of what I took out of it. But it's definitely more about not so much, you know, story plot than uh, emotions and uh, and all that. So I thought we'd mix things up today and have uh, Lee do a reading from one of the, the main entry that we're talking about. And while he's reading it, just in your minds, think about the potential connections to a song for Laia and other work Stuart has done and just the time of his life at the same time. So, Just to double check, this is the June 29th entry? Yeah, the June 29th entry. Why does a man volunteer for a job like this? Why does a man run to a silver ring six million miles beyond Pluto to guard a hole in space? Why throw away four years of life alone in the darkness? Why? I used to ask myself that in the early days. I couldn't answer it then. Now I think I can. I bitterly regretted the impulse that drove me out here then. Now I think I understand it. And it wasn't really an impulse. I ran to Cerberus. Ran. Ran to escape from loneliness. That doesn't make sense. Yet it does. I know about loneliness. It's been the theme of my life. I've been alone for as long as I can remember. But there are two kinds of loneliness. Most people don't realize the difference. I do. I've sampled both kinds. They talk and write about the loneliness of the men who man the star rings, the lighthouses of space and all that. And they're right. There are times out here at Cerberus when I think, I'm the only man in the universe. Earth is just a fever dream. The people I remember were just creations of my own mind. There are times out here when I want someone to talk to so badly that I scream and start pounding on the walls. There are times when the boredom crawls under my skin and all but drives me mad. There are other times, too, when the ring ships come. When I go outside to make repairs, or when I just sit in the control chair, imagining myself out into the darkness to watch the stars. Lonely? Yes. But a solemn, brooding, tragic loneliness that a man hates with a passion, and yet loves so much he craves for more. And then there's the second kind of loneliness. You don't need the Cerberus star ring for that kind. You can find it anywhere on Earth. I know. I did. I found it everywhere I went, in everything I did. It's the loneliness of people trapped within themselves. The loneliness of people who have said the wrong things so often they don't have the courage to say anything anymore. The loneliness, not of distance, but of fear. The loneliness of people who sit alone in furnished rooms in crowded cities because they've got nowhere to go and no one to talk to. The loneliness of guys who go to bars to meet someone only to discover that they don't know how to strike up a conversation and wouldn't have the courage to do so if they did. There's no grandeur to that kind of loneliness, no purpose and no poetry. It's loneliness without meaning. It's sad and squalid and pathetic, and it stinks of self-pity. Oh, yes, it hurts at times to be alone among the stars, but it hurts a lot more to be alone at a party. A lot more. Well, Red, uh, you can just keep going. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot how much I love that passage, too. Because yeah. it just comes out of nowhere, right? You're just like, yeah. it's, oh, this is an yeah. interesting short story, and then boom. Like. <laughs> it's so raw and honest, and, you know, even the you know, the self-pity, like he knows it, he sees it, but Mm. he's just finally admitting that to himself. It's so sad. And it's true. There's something about the, like, there are times where like, uh, you'll feel self-pity about something. You're sort of like, oh, well that rules it out. But like, that doesn't mean it's not a valid emotion. It just makes it all the worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you see the struggle with himself and then like the entry after, and and, like, he's like, oh, I'm just, you know, flippant about it. It's just like a back and forth struggle mentally that everyone has at some point. Yeah. 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 So there's a I, lot in that entry. To talk yeah, there about. is. Um, you weren't here for a, a song for Laia, but you've read it, right? Yeah, I love a song for Laia. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's connections here when he talks about the the first kind, where like a loneliness man still seeks and hates yeah. at the same time. I think that fits Rob and Dino kind of. Yeah, that hmm. makes sense to me. And I think there's also there's an element of of um, Laia that has that like mm. her like being a, what is it an empath a psychic like she has some like awareness of the differences between the two kinds of loneliness that I think is interesting. I think that there are ways in which a a song for Laia is a better crafted short story, Mm -hmm. but this one is just so raw and emotional that it's hard not to really like it. Mm. I think it was a song for Laia later. Did it come out after? Uh, I think it was, yeah, I think it was 74. It was 72, right? Yeah, that sounds right. This is an early one, like one of his first, I think. But I mean, it's also, and I hope we get to this eventually, like, this is raw and emotional, but it's nothing on the, like, brutality of Meat House Man. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it kind of echoes it, the urge, or pre, you know, you can see that it's it's in the, 
he's having the same emotions. It's that yeah. like, you know, feeling awkward and wanting to reach out and just not being able to. And it's so frustrating. Yeah. yeah I don't know if the, how the timelines work, but I kind of feel like this is more related to maybe like the build up to meeting the woman that he fell in love with. And then meet house man is after that, like hmm. that failed. Cause it's like two, two stages of loneliness It's like yeah. meeting up to her. And then meet house man is like, I finally met her. And then this happened. Oh, I didn't realize. That. I mean, he does have all that Karen stuff, or is it Karen? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. her name in here. So I mean, there must have been someone before. Is Meat House Man sure, the story that he said that he can't really he can't read anymore because it take it's too too emotional to go back to? Is that that story? Yeah. yeah. That was me. Okay. It's it's really hard to read. Yeah. No, I read it years yeah. ago in a zombie collection, but it, it I don't uh, I can't remember. <laughs> I remember there was some weird zombie sex stuff going on, but I don't remember. Yeah. I gotta reread oh, it. Oh, it is very raw. <laughs> yeah, like as we, we as we talked last time, he like, he says on his own biography that it, Meat House Man is inspired. And part of it is he was in love with somebody who fell in love with somebody else. And so he drew upon, he draws upon his experiences in his writing, which really helps his writing. Mm-hmm. I think Meat House Man is 76, and A Song for Leah is 74, and The Second Kind of Loneliness is 72. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 But we'll get, well, I guess, and I, it's, this is another comparison, again, not to spoil Meat House Man, which I guess we're not discussing today, but in both as The Second Kind of Loneliness and Meat House Man, the protagonists sort of respond to that loneliness in a very ugly way. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and there's something very authentic about that, but it's also like, I guess you can empathize, but it's difficult to sympathize. Yeah, it's really distasteful. It's just kind of, you can understand that feeling of rejection and kind of wallowing, but it's it's kind of just yucky to, to be in that headspace. Mm. Oh yeah, we'll definitely have to do Meat House Man because that's kind of like the completes the trilogy of loneliness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's also unlike from a maybe from like a gender perspective level. Like I think it's interesting that like these are not stories of like these guys who like were rejected and then because they were rejected by some mean woman like they lose it. Like these are just stories about how like these guys were kind of losers mm. and like they couldn't figure out their own issues and it's their own responsibility to do so. And I like that. Like. You know, George R. R. Martin's not perfect, but he's. It's nice reading his early short stories and sort of seeing that, like, he's often more progressive than mm. some. Like, I spend a lot of time on Tumblr, and he's often more progressive than a lot of people on Tumblr like to give him credit for. Mm. Yeah, of the ones I've read so far, I, I just like the fact that a lot of the themes that he and the stories he tells, they could be set in any type of universe. Just having them set oh, yeah. in a science fiction universe doesn't necessarily. It's it's not a one trick pony. It's not about the technology and the spaceships because that stuff's almost in the background. It doesn't really matter. And I, I just mm-hmm. like the fact that this could be about a guy who goes and lives in the mountains, you know, to to get away from everything. So, but it, mm-hmm. it's really it, it works on multiple levels. But I, I do like that it's not it, this kind of stuff doesn't only work in a science fiction <laughs> universe. Yeah, that's it's very point. human. Yeah. Just in that entry, he mentions fever dream, and that's one of his like recurring yeah. things that he just likes to use that term. I mean, he has a book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. He just likes what? the words. <laughs> we'll have to do a fever dream episode sometime. Yeah, I did read the comic version of Fever Dream, but I haven't read the uh, the actual novel. I'd love an excuse to reread that. <laughs> yeah, the Vessels of Kingsgrave has ruined my whole book reading because I'm I'm in like six <laughs> book clubs now, and I used to hate book clubs, but at least it's books I want to talk about now. <laughs> Yeah. I got lucky. Uh, you guys chose Ocean at the End of the Lane, which I'd already just listened to by coincidence, so now I don't have to right. stress right. myself out. Of course, everyone's going to say that I rigged the, the voting because that was my selection, but I, I did not rig the voting. <laughs> <laughs> or so you have to say in the public. Right, the, the three forum names I created and voted once yeah. and left. <laughs> but anyway. You've been running some of those alts for years. <laughs> Just waiting, biding your yeah. time. Shush, don't tell anyone. <laughs> So basically, he's been uh, on the space station for four years, just managing people, managing the ships that go through. Like they need somebody; it can't just be automated. Apparently. Yeah, I was wondering about that. Like, why can't it be? I mean, they have this such amazing, almost like a ring world technology where they've built this, you know, hundred mile. There's no way that they. It seems like he's almost irrelevant. Like it's a job they created just to have a job there. Like I, I feel like it could be automated, but uh, you know, maybe 1972 is is a you know far cry from how we think yeah. of of technology today. Mm-hmm. Maybe yeah. it's not so much that um, they really need. Need him to push the button to open and close the ring, but um, that they need a person there to do repairs or you know sort of just in case kind yeah. of stuff. It's I, like and this is maybe betrays my sort of prejudice about stuff like that. It's probably mostly just like a regulation. Like mm-hmm. you can't have like and you know I'm sure he's done useful things, but it's probably one of those things where like it's safer to have him there rather than to risk needing him there when he's not there. You know. 
Yeah. And I mean, it's just like from a, you know, it's, it would just take so long to get anyone there yeah. that having somebody there is probably cheaper in the long run than, you know. Yeah. Right. Well, also, I mean, like, yeah, like Amin said, like this, this was written in 72. Like, he may not have, he, he might have a ring world in space, but you might not have something that can automate it to run yeah. perfectly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I was just thinking like, well, at least if you, if you could have the internet, you could keep yourself busy. But <laughs> the, 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 the lack of faster than life travel, if even communication would be laggy. Like you wouldn't really be able to have it. It'd be so, you, it, I don't think it would work with current technology anyways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you could send, you know, like email or whatever, and it would be, <laughs> I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't yeah, like you could... live voice chat or whatever. The thing that I really thought that he's missing is video games, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, yeah, like he's got like, army. yeah, <laughs> like he's got books and movies and stuff, which are you know that's good. But yeah. what he really needs is a video. Yeah. Game. If he had Mountain Blade Warband, he could play that. Well. <laughs> well, he did get to write a crappy novel, so he at least had time for yeah. that. Sure. Yeah. And he yeah, threw, it doesn't seem. Out. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say it doesn't really seem like he's doing all that much. Like, yeah. Obviously, we're only getting little tiny snippets that pertain to you know one thing he's thinking about, but it's just like. I don't know. He should be jogging or pumping iron or something. <laughs> what, I did like how he, you know, blacks out where he goes into the center and blacks everything out, so it looks like, you know, he feels like he's just floating in the middle of space. And I'm sure that takes mm-hmm. up a, a lot of time, and you can do that for hours. Mm-hmm. Have you seen the artwork for, for this? Uh, the cover? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you've got really just look up second kind of loneliness, and it's the first image result. <clears throat> yeah. There's one illustration in the dream songs, you know, like a, a sketch at the beginning of each each story. There's one there. The one. I really don't care for those. <laughs> oh yeah, they're pretty simple. I must say, yeah. But this one is really good because, uh, and I think he talked about he himself wanted to buy it from the artist, and then he didn't, and now it's like really oh, cool. expensive. It's like is a really your, uh... good uh, visual f- like form of what he talks about in the story about like the beauty of the yeah. Thing. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask about, like, they talk about, you know, that it's sending the ships one way, and they think that there's, like, some idyllic planet on the other side of it. Were we under the impression that they kind of really don't know? This is, these are one-way trips, or he just doesn't no, know? No, I think that there, I think there is a planet on the other side, that, they, that uh, there is a colony world on the other side. <laughs> I think when they just... started, they didn't know, but by now they know, and I, I think they yeah. can come back. I think yeah, I think ways. so, too. Yeah. Um, I think it's just that they, um, the what they were saying that they didn't know was... Uh, they couldn't figure out where the planet was. Yeah. Okay. Like, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's that. That's a lovely science fictiony touch. Yeah, that's cool. He talks about uh, going to the new colonies, and then he's like, "That would be another escape." Like, what do you feel about that? I mean, like, I feel like one of his biggest flaws is that he spends so much time thinking about like, like maybe it would just be another escape, but also maybe it would be a new start. Like, you might as well try. Oh, sorry. There's a siren. <laughs> It's okay. Here, I'll mute till it's done. Yeah, I'm. I'm just not sure. I don't know. I'm not sure that there's really anything that he can do. That um, you know, he's wherever he goes, there he is, right? Like, yeah, I think, his past is always with him. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna take himself wherever he goes, and he just can't. You know, for whatever reason, like obviously he can't socialize very well. He wasn't the type to grow scar tissue easily. He didn't have the courage to try again, which is what he needs to do, right? He needs mm-hmm. to. Well, I mean, see, I don't. I mean, that's part of it, yeah. But even I think that even if that guy, you know, does try again, I'm just not sure that you know, like he obviously he just. I think that there's he's sort of missing something fundamental socially, and I'm mm-hmm. not saying that he couldn't grow it eventually, but like I think that's I think he has a a lot a much harder. Uh, path to walk than just like uh, gathering the courage to try again. Well, and I kind of got the feeling that his relationship with Karen was like his one, it was the one time that any girl actually gave him a break and gave him the time to get to know him a little bit. It's like he tried the one time and it, it didn't work out and that's that's it. That's all he's got in him. Well, I mean, so Karen was really, I mean, the way I read it anyway was that she was just like a friend, right? Mm-hmm. Like she wasn't, and so I mean, like it's the only time he's ever made friends with a woman at all. Like, you know, like that's, I'm not saying no one ever does that. I mean, that there are guys like that who just don't make friends with women. But I mean, I, I don't know. At that point, it's just sort of like if you're not like um, one of those, uh, you know, hookup guys or something, which obviously he isn't, um, then like I just I don't know. Like I feel like he's probably missed something fundamental pretty early. And I'm not saying you know that it's impossible for him to ever uh, you know reach some sort of a normal place, but just that. I, I don't think trying, you know, a couple of times or ten times 
is is the thing. I think that there's something a little more fundamental. Yeah, well, yeah. it did well, seem I mean, that it was more on his side than Karen's. You know, the whole relationship. You know, it was more. Well, I think him she, making some she more wanted out of to be. It. Yeah, she wanted to yeah. be friends, and she was cool with that. Yeah, and it but became like something he couldn't. Else. Yeah. He also, I, I will say, he knows exactly what his problem is. He knows he's too scared to try again. I mean, in the end, that's why he doesn't. That's why he stays. That's why he doesn't leave. But it's still like. I don't know. At the end of the day, like you kind of have to, you have to do it. And I think like George knows that. Like the character is not I think the yeah. character. Is a... The character has a, is a bit. I mean, he has social anxiety that is more than the norm. I mean, even just to talk yeah. with the people coming in. But he's an exaggeration slightly of what a lot of people experience at some point. You know, yeah. most people I would think experience at some point in their lives. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, I kind of wondered on a really boring technical aspect. Um, you know, he's talking about he ran to Cerberus, and it's like. Do they have a really limited number of volunteers, or do they just not evaluate him all that well? Because it seems like it would be so so vital to find someone who who could withstand that kind of. I mean, it's like being in solitary confinement. Just because you have activities doesn't mean you're not going to crack. So, you know, if you have a guy who shows up and you know is just like, yeah, I just want to leave the planet forever. I mean, it, it almost seems like a red flag. Unless nobody uh, wants to do that. Yeah, yeah I can well, see it. But one, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, again, from a purely technical uh, point of view, is that I sort of assume, and it's, it doesn't really come through in the journal entries, but I assume that there's a lot of technical skill, hmm. that this guy is actually yeah, relatively good. highly trained in you yeah. know, engineering or, or other hmm. things like that. And so he's actually... And so finding people that want to go off and live on a space station and are, you know, some sort of relatively high-level engineer kind of guy, that's what's difficult. I see it's kind of like the Grishka. It's like certain people are going to go to it anyways, and then, like, it's like the people you get are going to be the ones that be most vulnerable to being alone. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I, think that, yeah. I think this kind of job would naturally attract introverts, you know, just statistically maybe, but also we. Yeah. Um, it's just yeah. trying to put it into words that... The person who is, uh, you know, very comfortable with everything and is, is good socially, they're probably not going to volunteer for this kind of thing yeah. because who would want to mm-hmm. go? Even if you're getting going to have a million dollars when you get back, who are you going to say go out to your wife and kids for four years and just miss that just for a job opportunity? So it would yeah, kind yeah. of like self-select for people who are introverted, who are kind of want to escape, even if it's not a conscious decision they're making. So that's mm-hmm. just that's a that's one possible explanation. I'll say in this guy's defense, that, like. If I was there for four years, I would absolutely have lost my mind. <laughs> I think most people would. Yeah. Yeah, unless you had vassals of Kingsgrave to listen to. Right. <laughs> that would help get you through the first year, anyways, and then you run out of episodes. Well, they could have given him like a, a hollow deck or something to play on, you know, and like it, it's a hundred miles of of ring. You know, every every you know room has a different theme to it, and he can you know every couple of days just do something different. Yeah. Yeah. He lasts a pretty long time in his own. Yeah. Defense. Well, here's my question: Is this the first time that he's uh, well, take this thing, or is it? We don't know. That's that's part of yeah, the beauty of it. And I like the fact that the end, where you get it, sort of hits you with that. Re- you know, it's repetition, but you you yeah. don't know. Is it the first time he's done this? Is it the twentieth time he's done this? And mm-hmm. it sort of rem- it's like you know, I-, I love Groundhog Day. It's one of my favorite movies, but it didn't hit me until someone I heard it discussed saying that you know uh, you guys are all familiar with the concept of Groundhog Day. Yeah. Always reliving. They say yeah. if you think that he's done this ten thousand times, it completely changes. <laughs> it doesn't really become a comedy anymore. If he's yeah really the same day because you had to learn how to play piano you had to learn how to to do all this these things and it almost becomes yeah. really sad and yeah i thought that it was I it's not it was just like a couple times even longer yeah right. i thought it was supposed to be even longer than ten thousand times yeah in an it was interview, supposed to be like a hundred years or right something. in an interview with the director it, you it's supposed to be like mil like he's done this millions of times mm-hmm. like it's it's infinite yeah. I, I can look it up um, no no I, I remember hearing no, that yeah. but I just like how you kind of get that and it kind of reminds me of um, I remember Stephen King was doing an interview where someone asked him what's your idea of hell and he said hell is repetition and he's got this mm. story called um, <laughs> that feeling you can only say what it is in French about a guy who basically has to relive dying over and over again and it just freaks the crap out of me if thinking that you can't break the cycle and th- that's why I feel so bad for this guy because you don't know how many times he's done it he, he could yeah. be doing this he could be an old guy with the gray beard doing this you know going crazy and we, we just have no idea and not only is it horrifying for him but at a certain point okay now he's killing people and how yeah. many times are they gonna send someone out you know you just don't know when do they figure out that it's not an accident yeah, <laughs> yeah they're well, just they sending empty ships to it. <laughs> and even when they even when they do figure it out what are they gonna do 
Uh, that's the thing. Like, do they have some sort of fail safe here in case the guy goes crazy? Because it seems like people can go crazy when they go on this. Or they yeah. can just have a heart attack and leave the station unmanned. And they just gotta send. They gotta send them one of the big ships that can handle the energy. Yeah. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about it, and um, I was thinking like from a certain. I guess it depends on who owns the ring. Yeah. But from a certain sort of uh, evil corporate point of view, like it could be like they send out a couple of uh, of resupply ships or whatever, and then they both get destroyed, and then they're like, "Well, listen, the ring is functioning, so you know, until the ring stops working, maybe just fuck it, you know." <laughs> yeah, I get that. Um, gonna, but I'm... go ahead. Obviously, people are probably just going to die trying to fix it. So, like, yeah. Well, like we said earlier, in there somehow there's going to be some sort of like fail safe. I mean, do we know what's? We don't even really know what's going on on the other side. So it just kind of. I don't seems... know if, if is there a ring on the other side or is it just a one way guy that does on this side that opens it for both ways. I don't know. We know uh, there's other never... rings, right? But we don't know if there's like it's a it's a tunnel. It could just be a gate. You know, doesn't need a door on each side. I don't know. True, yeah. I mean, the implication is certainly. I mean, he knows the name of the world on the other side, and and that they don't know where it is. So based on that, there must be two way traffic. But I don't know if the two way traffic comes right through the same ring or not. Mm. It's not even. You don't even really need one on the other side as long as he communicates with like the microscopic hole. Then you can just say, "Open the gate." Yeah. So. And just to correct the Groundhog Day thing I brought up, it was 10,000 years. It was Harold Ramis talking to Stephen Tobolowsky, the guy who played uh, Ned Ryerson, who we kept meeting every day. So, yeah. There we go. 10,000 years. Even That's worse. That's a nightmare. <laughs> Ugh. Bing. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrifying. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, at the same time, like, he did obviously, like, he found peace in it in the end, right? So, yeah. I mean, like, the last day or whatever was, you know. Yeah. And I, I have to assume. I mean, I, I sort of think of it as like the whole. Um, sorry, I don't know why we're talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my fault. Um, but I was gonna say, is, like, is uh, it a girl, what's the girl's name Karen in that thing, or is that something yeah. else? <laughs> <laughs> but I was gonna say, like, a like a, a striving for self perfection, or like a Christian purgatory kind of a thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's mm-hmm. a long, long process um, where you, you know, eventually are are perfected. And so, like, I sort of feel like. Uh, somewhere, you know, like after a thousand years or, you know, a hundred years or whatever, he was on the path, right, where he was moving towards perfection. And that once it, once he was doing that, that uh, if the days got easier or whatever. But yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the Groundhog Day, Bastards of Grand. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I would have lost my mind in like a day if, in Groundhog Day or on this satellite thing i think that like once i'd watched my way through all the tv movies and books i could think of in like a month i would just like spiral <laughs> the grishka would be looking pretty good at that point oh. really good <laughs> this is like the opposite of the grishka this is like the other end of the spectrum right he's like yeah and then yeah. Was, i think this is a man who would have liked the grishka <laughs> oh yeah yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's one of those, you know, damaged people that probably would have been in that, that 1% that, that went over yeah. relatively easily. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. When you were reading this, Amber, how did you feel about this story? From a, a from a girl to... perspective? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I love the, just personally, I love the way he describes the second kind of loneliness. You know, just going back to the passage that you read, um, you know, I think every person in the world has been there at some point where you're in he, uh, some you know, beautiful part of nature alone. And it's so beautiful and so heartbreaking that if you don't have someone to share it with. Um, but I will say that, and it, and it is, you know, and we've also all been alone at a party and it's terrible. Um, it's the worst feeling ever, but I can't help but just be annoyed. Like, well, dude, no wonder she was not into you because you know, you're, you're doing this to yourself. He, he knew from the beginning that she, he says she loves everyone. And maybe that's why he chose her to make his attempt. But I, I guess, you know, and I know there are people that are so socially, you know, for whatever reason they're stunted or they're just, their development is arrested and they can't, they can't express themselves. But like, I, I could certainly empathize with Karen like you want to be this guy's friend but you're very clear that it's not going anywhere and then you know you have that talk and you can see that you've just destroyed someone's soul it's that's also an awful feeling and it's sad that he has to put them both in that position 
Yeah, and it, it would hurt it hurts Karen herself as well to have to do that, right? He put it on her to, mm-hmm. to have to do that. But at least he in this story he gets that he's not blaming her. Like he could have gone the other way and been like, "Oh, it's all her fault." But right, which yeah, I appreciate. Yeah, he certainly could have been a worse person about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that was something I was gonna say was that um that's one reason why like what he needs isn't necessarily like the courage to continue, mm. right? Like it's not his problem with Karen wasn't that uh, that he lacked the courage. It was that um. You know, like he knew he knew she didn't like him, right? Like he shouldn't have had the courage. He knew it. <laughs> right? Like all it did That's was put true. both of them was put both of them in a bad position and he knew that before he did it. Right, like courage isn't his problem. I mean, it may be one of his problems, but that's not his problem. His problem is just socialization. No, but he, he yeah. needs to, he needs to go meet new people. Like not meeting does, people is not going to do anything to him. He yeah, absolutely. He needs to meet new people. I mean, that's true. But again, I don't I don't think. I don't think that's his, I don't think courage is a problem, but yeah. Well, I think in addition to meeting new people, he, it would have been nice if in his four years here, it seemed like for a while he was getting to that point, but it's like, he needs to learn to love himself, not to be really cheesy, but it's like, he is, he's feeling this emptiness and this loneliness and he is looking everywhere outside of himself to fill that. Um, And in this universe, there is no Grishka and there's, you know, there's no guarantee. So he needs to find some way to um, just be able to be happy with who he is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a thing. People say it all the time, but it's like, if you can't be happy by yourself, you're not going to be happy with anyone. Kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, and I, I guess this is sort of what I was trying to say a little bit earlier. And it's just that he's definitely like, there's something wrong with him. But I also like, I respect that he at least knows that. Like, Absolutely. There are a lot of versions of this story where he just like whines about how like it's all somebody else's fault. But, like he knows that it's his fault. Yeah, yeah it does take a certain yeah. a certain amount of courage just to admit that. And yeah. like, once and once sure you admit that, you can go one way or the other. He kind of decided to go to fall back on it rather than use that as a jumping yeah. board to go forward. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and he's so close. It, I mean, it really does seem like you know he's just on the verge of being able to be a functional person and maybe go back and maybe you know try again and he'll be that cool guy who lived in space on his own for four years yeah people would be attracted to that if only he had filmed it and stuff and put on youtube yeah exactly (laughs) well he mentions that he's like oh i should have recorded the uh everything yeah uh, to next time buddy <laughs> well, it, it, well, it's scary that one part where he's like, maybe I should just stick around for another four years. He's like trying to convince himself to <laughs> to stay, and it's like, yeah, that's oh, bleak. Yeah. Don't do that. It's really bleak. Yeah. Well, I mean, just the fact that when he when he finally brings up his memory and he's like, they're coming, and he doesn't. He, he's just like, what am I going to say to them? I don't know what I'm going to say to them, and he just like presses the button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It almost what felt like in- an. Oh no! Go, go ahead. Oh, this is completely out of the blue, but I'm just flipping through, and I, I think it's interesting that it took him so long to find that bottle of scotch. <laughs> well, that was only this time around. He's probably found it 50 other times and taken a couple yeah, sips out of or it. Yeah, I guess, yeah, that he has any left. Right. Yeah. The, the thing against it being, I mean, it, yeah, unless you have the, the companies being, like, cynical and keeping him there, that there's ring ships coming all the time, and they're just going through. If he's repeating all the time, they're not really caring. They're not... Uh, like he has all these ring ships, none of them stop to try to do something. They just kind of pass through. Also, they never yeah, even communicate of... with him at all. That's so what you... I was about. It's it's odd to me. Uh, from again, like it's not really, uh, you know, it's the way it is for the story. But um, uh, just from a realism sort of point of view, it, it is strange that he re- neither sends nor receives any kinds of transmissions ever. Well, he gets radio transmissions saying that they're coming, but they don't really talk. Just, yeah, that's what I'm. Yeah, it seems like yeah, it's more of like a notification. Like, yeah. yeah, like yeah. incoming ship, and they don't slow down. They just go right. They yeah. expect you to open the gate. Right. But that they wouldn't be like, you know, thanks very much, you know, and he's like, no problem, clear sailing, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to mention uh, any story that's a first person, you can't help but sort of want that person to be the hero, the protagonist of the story, and he's the only character mm-hmm. that we find it, that we hear about. But you know, from his point of view, but it's almost that I felt relieved when he finally kind of snapped, and you know, that last entry where you get the same line as you did from the first one, where okay, it's starting again. It's like ah, okay, we're back. It's like all that awful stuff that he brought up. Now it's buried again, and now we can just move forward because he kind of he found he found a way to like grab me in and to make me almost be the guy, and then to like okay, I'm mm-hmm. glad that we don't have to deal with that stuff that we talked about before. We're just gonna go forward and see what happens this time. But I thought it was interesting how he, uh, you know, because when I read a song for Laia, I didn't particularly like Rob, but I understood where he was coming from. But um, this one, he, he really makes me care about him, and I just feel super sorry for him. So do you think yeah. that there's a chance that 
you know, because you you just kind of can't help but assume, okay, maybe they'll just sh- send another ship. Um, do you think that he will be able to to leave ever? Uh, I don't know that I, I do. I think they I will eventually take it over because just like economics demands that they get this thing under control. Well, but do you think right. that he would voluntarily? Oh, like, as a, no. As opposed they'll, to they'll have to take it by force, probably. Yeah. He's going to be in jail. <laughs> sequel. Yeah. And that'll be the third kind of loneliness. <laughs> the sequel, the third kind. <laughs> oh, here's a twist ending. It was Karen was on the, his relief on the ship. And he blew uh, her up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> That's all I have to really say about the story, actually. I mean, like, we, we covered it pretty well. Yeah, it's it's not a long story. Yeah. I wanted to mention something about so- Song for Lia that I, I forgot to... Uh, mentioned last week but i've actually mentioned on the podcast before is just the, the some of the similarities uh, or i guess precursor kind of to the old gods tree net system and uh, the grishka in terms of these holding mm. memories mm. Mm. Those, yeah uh, parallel there mm-hmm. somebody brought it up on twitter but i i had yeah, to see that cool any uh, final comments on this this work or i don't know should we do uh What's Very the one night scorpion. The okay game. Oh. <laughs> it's the problem is there's not enough people. Yeah. There's not enough. Oh it's Karen goodness. and this guy, basically. Yeah, let's all marry Karen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah she seems super nice. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about that. The scorpions for the relief guy. Aww. Uh-huh. <laughs> that guy's like, yes, I'm going to finally get a loan to yeah. help my problems. I can write my I can write my book now, and somebody blew me up. <laughs> now he's just on the Darkling Plane. Yeah. Oh, the damn Darkling Plane. <laughs> I, was, I was going to mention Darkling Plane. Darkling Plane is when your MP3 Skype recorder doesn't work, and then you've been telling <laughs> Darkling Plane. <laughs> <laughs> Podcast, and it doesn't. Now we have a term for it. <laughs> uh-uh. <laughs> oh, freaking Lost recording Darkling dark dark. Plane again. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I like Those lost podcasts are on the darkling plane. <laughs> yeah, we managed to rescue the last uh, podcast and vice fire from it though. Recovered it. Is that the the one fifty one or yeah the one with the sh- I mean the one with the shitty audio. It yeah, have it, but it's just horrible audio. It was yeah. I could hear I just couldn't hear you that well. I could hear Kyle and uh, Ashley pretty pretty well, just a little distorted. Yeah, and I have to say it was a lot better than the uh, the, B- the you and Ashley B O K Fire Con. Yeah, yeah, that was that or was un- fucking believable. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't well, that the, one yet. The, the thing was, uh, I spent a lot more time in the podcast one to try to fix yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't have the patience to do the same thing with the B O K one. I just yeah, put totally. It out. So you can see the difference. I had to really yeah. reclaim the audio on the one. I put it through so many filters and did all this stuff. It's like, well, and it really just seems like black magic to me. <laughs> <laughs> Although you did seem really, when you did your little announcement about the poor audio quality at the beginning, it sounded like you recorded that just after you'd spent like 10 hours working on it. <laughs> you yeah. It did sound pretty, pretty drained. Pretty down. <laughs> yeah. I was like, my relief's on the way. But here, I have this <laughs> 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 Yeah, I was tired. <laughs> oh, usually my all my editor stuff would probably be tired. It's like after I've edited it, I, I need to put something at the, yeah. the start. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what this guy needed. It was a podcast, Fast and Fire, and be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, totally. He needed communication streaming back and forth. Sure. Yeah. All right. So, what are we doing next? What's up next? Um, what do we think? I'm looking I forward to down Sand down Kings. I, I know that's I that's my favorite. Sand Kings. Yeah. yeah. We will do Meat House Man at some point too, as I said. Yeah, I think yeah let's it's save that. a little more fun. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's let's build up to Meat House Man. Yeah, I'm I'm good for that. Yeah. Maybe Sand Kings next. I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. there are yeah. tons. I mean, we can just work our way through Dream Songs, doing the best stories. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm slowly just picking, choosing, picking and choosing random stories throughout mm-hmm. it. But um, I mean, I know there's a couple. I've read like the big, you know, the three that you had mentioned here so far. But um. I haven't read the Ice Dragon. I know there's talks about Ice Dragon. People are like always it. trying to, you know, tie it into Ice and Fire, but it's really just a kid's book. But uh, it's, it's, not. A, it's a kid's no. book with, with like burning, mutilation, and rape. Yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I had the original like Bantam edition, which was like it was issued as a like a middle reader book, and it had nice nice illustrations. And now they're reissuing it with like much darker, realistic illustrations. So it's mm. it's all on how they, mm. the, the the publisher chooses to package it. Oh wow! Yeah. I'd love to have a copy of that. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, that'd be a great next. Uh, let's do a uh, Sand Kings next. That'll be fun. That's such a good one. Yeah, Sand Kings is great. I really want some of those things, but <laughs> yeah, I would. I did, but uh, I, uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's a no. I want them so much. <laughs> I did really? uh, on sound variations with uh, Michael before and Vic. I don't know if you yeah, guys yeah, that was good. Michael, you want to feed your enemies to them? No, no, I'm gonna be super nice. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> oh, you want the Sand Kings? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> you know they they made um. Like a 
Outer Limits adaptation of it, but it was shit. It was like, yeah, uh, so yeah they should have just stuck to the story instead of doing all this, like changing it and all of that. It was still creepy though. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I need that. Um, I don't. I don't need a life size, you know, castle with my face on it. I don't mind that. It's as long as they were not. If they weren't insect based, I mean, I freak the crap out when I find a spider. I would not be able to sit and enjoy warring cockroaches <gasps> or whatever uh, they are. See, I think I'd be I'd be too creeped out if they weren't like very clearly non-humanoid or whatever. Uh, if they looked like people at all, that would be ick, ick, ick. But they kind of do but, look like people. That's the whole thing. Well, but yeah. like insect people, so I don't have to like feel bad about it or anything. Squirrels. Squirrels would be the best. <laughs> little warring squirrel clans. That's uh, worse. With little helmets and, and bow and arrows. Oh, that's like my uh, worst. It's, no, it's yeah, turtles. Be terrible. Have turtles. Turtles. Aww. Yeah. yeah, any kind of reptile, I think that would be fine. Reptiles or insects. Martin really. said he wrote like stories about the turtles, and they had like the turtle king and like the yeah the murder of the turtle king and all this stuff. Yeah, they, they always wanted to go behind the fridge. He said they'd always go under the <laughs> fridge and die. Yeah, it's like the holy grail of turtles. <laughs> we used to have That's eels. The, uh, we had the, eels in a in a fish tank, and they disappeared one day. And years later, we found we thought there were banana peels behind the fish tank, and there were just oh, three God. dried uh-huh. up eels. <laughs> so we don't oh. have eels anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's so upsetting. Yeah. Did you? Have- how does that happen? They jumped. They they can. They jumped out of the tank. They popped the tops and just got out of the tank. Which is Lord Vanderbilt was like wasted oh. eels. Yeah, those lamp no lamprey pies <laughs> from this. <laughs> All right, uh, that's good. I'm gonna well, end this thing. But thanks for joining us. Thank yeah, you. it's yeah, been a pleasure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Let's hope this is this one isn't on the Darkling plane. Yes. Yeah. yeah. See you guys later. All right, yeah, take it easy.